Well, we're we're very happy to have our next speaker, uh, Tom Pittman from Cornell University. And um, thanks for virtually being here this uh, afternoon. So go ahead, Tom. All right, thanks a lot. And thanks to the organizers for putting together this great meeting. Uh, so I'm here virtually. Uh, so what, um, well, to get started, uh, let me start with some motivation. So I'm gonna just start by discussing some puzzles involving the sum over topologies in 3D gravity. So in 2007, uh, Maloney and Witten attempted to calculate the torus partition function of pure gravity, pure gravity meaning just the metric, uh, which could make sense in three dimensions, but um, they did this calculation by summing over all the known contributions, which are saddle points together with the perturbative corrections around the saddles. So they did this calculation, the semi-class little approximation. Uh, this is a sum of the, um, the saddle point contributions with the perturbative corrections. The sum over black hole is a sum over the SL2Z family of black holes. So the answer that they, uh, the, the proposal that they made is that this calculation is done by uh, this SL2Z sum, which is called a, a Poincaré series. Uh, one way we can think about this is we take the Virasoro vacuum character, which is the perturbative contribution on one uh, of these saddle points, and sum that over the uh, SL2Z black holes. The result of this calculation is inconsistent with ADS CFT, or really it's inconsistent with a quantum mechanical uh, interpretation. The spectrum is continuous and uh, non unitary. This is an avatar of the information puzzle more generally, I think, in that uh, when you do a gravitational path integral, there's no guarantee that you'll end up with an answer that's consistent uh, with quantum mechanics because gravitational path integrals do not reproduce uh, the underlying microstates. There's a similar problem if we consider multiple boundaries, which is known as the factorization problem. Uh, in the context uh, of 3D black holes, you can see this, for example, by looking at the double torus. So if we calculate the product of partition functions, then obviously in quantum mechanics, this should just be a product of two numbers. We shouldn't get anything new when we take their product. And yet when you do this calculation using the ordinary rules of ADS CFT, uh, then um, there are potentially contributions from topologies, connected topologies like this one, which is called the double torus. Um, and recently these contributions have been calculated and they, they don't give zero. So this is a puzzle. Um, so again, the bulk path integral doesn't respect boundary quantum mechanics. These are two distinct puzzles, the puzzle of uh, Maloney and Witten on the uh, problems with the torus partition function and the factorization puzzle. Uh, but I think that these puzzles probably need to be solved together. And there are some proposals, there's a partial uh, proposal for how this might work, at least in certain limits, uh, for example, in the work of Maxfield and Turiachi from last year. So, there are different points of view on what these puzzles mean and how to proceed. Um, let me uh, sort of mention a few of them. The skeptic, the viewpoint of the skeptic is that uh, these calculations are uh, potentially just uncontrolled. The sum over topologies uh, isn't controlled, that we're, we're talking about off-shell configurations and we don't know how to calculate their contribution to the path integral, that in a real theory of quantum gravity, uh, there will be other corrections that are just as large, so we should just ignore uh, these bad contributions like the, like the uh, non-factorizing ones. Well, I, I don't think this is really a viable point of view any longer uh, after the discovery, especially of the JT random matrix duality and other situations where wormholes play a role and seem to do something important for you. So these topologies are selling, telling us something and we need to figure out uh, what it is. There's the ensemble averager point of view. This point of view uh, is that space-time wormholes in the bulk mean that gravity is dual to an ensemble average of boundary CFTs. And in the context of 3D gravity and the Maloney-Witten calculation, this would mean that the average spectrum 
uh, is continuous, which is a perfectly acceptable uh, uh, situation for an ensemble average of CFTs, unlike an, an individual CFT. It's okay for the spectrum to be continuous. Well, this point of view is uh, true for JT gravity um, and potentially true, potentially there's a statement like this for pure gravity in three dimensions, but it's probably not uh, true. Actually, I meant to say probably not in D greater than three here. It's quite, quite possible that, that pure gravity in, in three dimensions uh, does have an ensemble interpretation. Can I ask you a quick question about yeah. that? I mean, it, what would be the ensemble of dual 2D CFTs that you would be integrating over? With I have no idea. Maybe it's all CFTs. We don't know. We don't know. Probably be an ensemble of solutions of the modular, you know, like another you know, modular invariant partition functions that aren't actually CFT partition functions. Couldn't it be an average over that kind of object, like over sets of characters rather than CFTs? Well, I think that's I think that's possible if we do some partial calculation. Um, but once we start including things like in like a double torus inside, um, I think we're including, I think we're talking about more than just the torus bootstrap. Okay. Now, maybe it's a solution of some bigger set of bootstrap equations. Maybe it's a, an average solution of some bigger set of bootstrap equations, but I don't think it can just be the modular the torus equation. Okay. Maybe I'll talk to you more about it later. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, one more question. Hey, Tom, uh, just I thought I made that comment to you last week in Prague, and you agreed that this fact is not established in JT yet because it's really only perturbatively established. Yeah, um, it's 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 true in some sense for JT for for the the way that JT is is being treated right now. But I agree that that's not a fully. Uh, uh, it's not just perturbative. There there's there's non perturbative and and doubly non -perturb even doubly non perturbative things that that agree. Um, but I, interested in JT, I would say. Sorry, I couldn't hear. The latter, the doubly non perturbative part, is not understood in JT. I thought. Did, did you say the doubly non perturbative part is not there? I could, it's hard to hear. I was not understood how to get it from JT. Um, yes, not, not, that's true. That's true. Not entirely, although it's, um, yeah. I, I agree with that, that, that even in, in JT, maybe, maybe there's a more complete definition of JT um, that includes, that includes non-perturbative information and, and it's no longer an average. That's, that's, that's yeah. certainly possible. Okay, um, the, the, the third point of view, uh, is the, that of an effective field theorist. And this um, is just the point of view that the UV theory is quantum mechanics, but higher topologies do meaningfully compute certain self-averaging observables. Uh, and presumably, this is how it works in realistic UV complete theories, um, like we get in microscopic examples of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, but it's not a complete answer. If, if, this is, if this is our point of view, then we have to understand which observables are universal. So it, it's possible that we can, maybe we can use the gravitational path integral um, to calculate all the universal quantities, but what are those universal quantities? Uh, and how can we tell when our calculations are, are controlled and, and extract as much as we can about the microscopic from those quantities? So that's, that's our, our task as, as low energy effective field theorists. Um, so this was just motivation, really. And what I want to do in this talk is I'll describe toy models for 3D gravity and 2D CFT, uh, where we can just try to explore some of these issues involving averaging and extracting details of the microscopic theory. The basic idea of these toy models is to take SL2R, uh, which uh, to take SL2R and the Virasoro algebra, which are relevant to 3D gravity, and replace them by uh, U1 to the n symmetries and, and uh, U1 to the n current algebra. Uh, just because in this case, um, we can define an ensemble, we can define an ensemble of CFTs. We can do many of these calculations in great detail, uh, 
uh, and try to understand how some of these how some of these things work, including the averaging. Um, okay, so that's where we're headed, and it's based uh, primarily on on these three papers uh, in the last year. So the starting point is a proposal um, which I'll call the Narain duality that um, we made last, week, last year and was simultaneously made by Maloney and Witten. So here's a proposal. Consider n free bosons in two dimensions. So this is just a classic, uh, the classic toroidal CFT, free bosons, the compact target space. Uh, and this is a CFT with n squared moduli. The proposal is the ensemble average of this theory over moduli space, averaged over moduli space, is holographically dual to an exotic theory of three-dimensional gravity. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch to even call this gravity. It's so exotic, uh, but um, it has some gravity-like features. It's a uh, it's related. It's perturbatively a u1 to the n left by u1 to the n right uh, three-dimensional Trent-Simons theory. We take that perturbative theory and sum it over topologies. This is a prescription that's put in by hand. It's not something you would do in turn Simon's theory. Uh, it's, it's something we're, we're putting in by hand, and we call this theory uh, U1 gravity. You can think of this as, uh, well, at least roughly, I think you can think of this as a induced gravity, because um, these once, once you put in these U1 to the N gauge fields, uh, there will be a boundary current algebra and therefore a boundary Virasora algebra, which you can think of as, as a composite graviton built out of the U1 currents. I also want to discuss uh, this more recent paper uh, with Zheng Kai Dong and, and Yi Kuen Zhang. Uh, what we did uh, in this paper is to add matter to the bulk in this duality. So. Um, I'm going to go through both uh, together, and at each step, I'll tell you how we how we uh, add matter to the duality. Um, so, the 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 CFT dual in this case that we're considering the CFT is WZW models averaged over their moduli space. So WZW models have a moduli space of 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 exactly marginal deformations, uh, which. I guess more accurately, I should call them deformed WZW models. They're not, they're not WZW models anymore, uh, but the WZW model lives at a point of enhanced symmetry on this moduli space. And this case uh, is dual to that same theory of U1 gravity plus topological matter fields to account for the extra stuff in the CFT. So why bother uh, with with this, well, there's there's two reasons at least. One is that um, these are boundary CFTs with central charge greater than the number of conserved currents. There's been a lot of discussion and speculation as to whether um, as to whether exactly what role this this inequality plays in the distinction between gravity-like theories and rational theories and uh, non-gravitational theories. So this is a case. Uh, where where it looks holographic, but but C is a bit larger. So in that sense, this is a little bit more like a little bit more gravity like perhaps uh, than than the case where where C is less than the number of currents or equal as it is in the in the ordinary uh, Narain CFTs. Um, while there are other reasons to add matter, uh, once we have matter, we can talk about correlation functions. Maybe we can talk about more elaborate things like the factorization of subregions. These have not been done, um, but um, at least we can start to think about things, things like this once we have uh, matter fields to use as probes in this duality. Okay, so uh, I wanna discuss the calculation of the average torus partition function. I'm gonna start with the CFT uh, calculation and describe how this average is done and what we mean by averaging over CFTs. Once we've done that, the 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 bulk is is pretty straightforward and automatic. So we're going to spend uh, spend most of our time talking about how to do this average. The toroidal CFT uh, that we start with is a two dimensional CFT of n compact bosons. This is just the usual. Uh, toroidal compactification of the bosonic string. 
The partition function of this theory uh, has uh, has a also has a, a um, part that's dictated by the U1 symmetry, which is which are these eta functions, and uh, then it has a sum over primaries, uh, which is a, what's called a siegel narain theta function, uh, which is a, a theta function defined for a Narain lattice. So a Narain lattice is an even self-dual lattice um, of signature n comma n. This can be generalized to other signatures, but I'm going to focus on, on this case. These theories have moduli space. Uh, famously, the moduli space of Narain CFTs uh, is um, given by this quotient. So the, the moduli space of Narain lattices is the, the numerator, this O n comma n. Uh, so it's a, it's a general fact that all Narain lattices are related to each other by these O n comma n rotations. Uh, but the theory, the CFT is, is unaffected by the O n's that live in the, the two individual factors. And uh, we also divide out by the T duality group, which is this O n n comma z in the denominator here. There's a natural metric on moduli space, which is the Zamlogikov metric. And in the case of uh, Narain CFTs, this coincides with the Haar measure for O n comma n. Um, to add matter to this theory, uh, what I mean by adding matter is going to this WZW model. So the deformed WZW models can be described as follows. Uh, we start with a SU n plus one level K WZW model. Uh, this CFT has exactly marginal current current deformations. So that is, uh, we add to this uh, some um, some combination some linear combination of these deformations, uh, where you just pick a left and right moving current from the Cartan. So this has uh, dimension exactly one comma one, and uh, we have to pick it from the Cartan because if you add non-commuting, uh, if you add any, if you add non-commuting currents, then they'll pick up anomalous dimensions, and so they're not exactly marginal. We can bosonize these Cartan currents, and this gives uh, what's called the parafermion or coset representation of the WZW model. So um, let me break this down a little bit. So we start with the SUN. We start with the WZW here in the numerator. Uh, bosonizing means um, we extract the U1 currents. So we, we divide out these U1 currents and replace them by a bunch of free bosons. So the Narain factor here is the, uh, is the um, free boson theory with some um, at some particular point in moduli space, which is picked out for you by the, w, by the WZW model. Uh, it's, now, these two factors, it's important that these two factors don't quite decouple. So we're not going to do something trivial here where you just extract out a free boson and um, everything else comes along for the ride, because there's a non-trivial um, non um, orbifold action here, which couples the, uh, the first factor. To the, to the bosons. So this first factor, uh, this is called the parafermions. Uh, so what we have is a uh, is parafermions, Narain or toroidal CFT uh, with an orbifold. The uh, moduli space lives entirely in the Narain factor here. Um, so the moduli space is locally equivalent to the Narain modul moduli space. Uh, now, the dualities in these theories uh, are different. The, so the duality group in the WZW model is smaller. It's much smaller than the duality group of the, of the free boson because there's all this extra, extra information coming along that's uh, not invariant under most of the dualities. Um, so the moduli space globals is, is globally different, um, but that doesn't really cause an issue uh, for, the, for calculating the torus partition function since it's insensitive to all this other data, like the OP coefficients that come along here. So as I said, the orbifold couples the boson sector to the parafermions. Um, and 
the standard orbifold uh, procedure, you go through the standard orbifold procedure and you can write the partition function of this theory uh, as a sum over twisted sectors, that's the alpha and beta, the twists along the two directions of a parafermion factor and a boson factor. The boson factor is now a twisted version of the siegel norain theta function. Uh, surprisingly, the, this coset had, had, as far as we can tell, had actually never been written down in the literature, although something very similar was done by, by Furstad and, and, and Roggenkamp uh, a long time ago, and we're using, uh, we're building on their results to do this. Okay, so those are the theories that we're talking about. Now we want to calculate the average partition function. So in the, the, the average partition function of the free boson is just an integral over moduli with the Haar measure. So the moduli are the... Are the... Can you hear me? Yes? All right, sorry. Um, it, took a, it took me a while to get the mic. Um, can I just ask a question about the previous slide? Sure. So um, once you deform away, you said the theories are no longer rational. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. That's right. But... Are they still integrable somehow? Like this looks kind. Of, I mean, this is like a JJ Bard deformation, which, like, is the spectrum known once you deform? Is the spectrum known exactly once you deform away? Is there like a simple formula to, to write down the, the spectrum of the deformed theory? It's simple-ish. Yeah, the spectrum is known. I would say it's known exactly. These parafermion, so these parafermion factors, are uh, annoying to calculate, but you can calculate them term by term uh, as high as you like. I see. So the spectrum is exactly known. Right. So, so it, it's, it's fair to call this like an integrable deformation. So it's no longer rational, but it's like an integrable deformation of a rational CFT. Yes, that's right. It's, it's a bit, it's, so the, the, the free boson at an, at an irrational radius is also irrational. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's non-rational in a similar way, but uh, with, with this extra stuff. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Is there another quick, uh, go ahead, me? Yeah, yeah, Tom, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, so we wanna do this average. Um, now, uh, it, it's, it came as a big surprise to us that actually this average was calculated by Siegel in 1951 or, or even earlier. Um, and this is, this is now understood as a special case of uh, what's called the siegel vey formula. Which, which relates average theta functions uh, to Eisenstein series. This is a very general relationship. It can be applied to all sorts of different settings. What we need is just a, a simple uh, version of it uh, that was already understood by Siegel. So Siegel uh, calculated the average for any even lattice, not necessarily self-dual. We're interested uh, mostly in the self-dual case. Um, to state Siegel's theorem, uh, let's first look at the singularities of the partition function near rational points in, in terms of tau. That is, we take tau to a rational point uh, on the real axis um, uh, bounding the upper half plane. So when you take tau to a rational point, uh, you can read off using modular the modular properties of the theta function, you can read off its singular behavior, and it's going to have some power loss singularity uh, and some coefficient. The coefficient depends on the genus of the lattice. So the genus of a lattice means, for example, uh, even self-dual lattices are, are a genus. Uh, so it depends on that, 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 that type of lattice, but not on the moduli. Then the siegel a formula states that uh, the average over moduli space is the sum of the singularities. So what's showing up on the right-hand side here is just summing over all the rational points, that is the, the, the uh, cusps of, of SL2Z on the real line, um, summing all those up with the coefficients that, were, that we read off from the modular transformation properties of the theta function. For the genus of Narain lattices, this uh, coefficient factor is actually trivial, it's one, so you simply get a sum of uh, of the, the singular, the power law term. This sum is called the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, and it's something that uh, has been studied a lot, and that sum can be 
more or less done uh, in a in in a, a, a form that's essentially closed. For practical purposes, you can you can learn anything you'd like to uh, about this sum. For the case where we add matter, remember we need to talk about the twisted siegel norain theta function. So this is not a case that uh, Siegel considered, uh, but we redid the uh, analysis for this case. And, and after quite a bit of um, complication in the intermediate steps, you end up with a, with a really simple answer, which is that turning on uh, twist just projects onto a subset of terms in the sum. So it, it's, the same, it's the same Eisenstein series looking thing is the sum over um, these singular points, but now only, uh, only certain terms that satisfy a, a selection rule are, are included in the sum. Let me pause here since that was sort of technical and just state in words the, the, like how this is working, the intuition for what's going on with Siegel Bay. The idea is that uh, what happens is that the essentially the Cardi formula, it's it's a souped up Cardi formula uh, because it also includes is, includes the other SL2Z transformations, not just the S transformation. But this souped up Cardi formula gives exact results for the we average. The Cardi all the time. Still now? Can you can you hear me? Yes. You can't hear me? Yeah, we can't hear you still. I'm not sure what happened. Hold on a minute. Sorry. Testing, Sorry testing. Can you continue? Can you hear me? I hear, I hear him very softly. No, there he is. Uh, I don't think anything changed here. I well, still we, get- We can hear you very softly. So there must be a problem with our- No, they've done just thing. switching it to something else. Again? Testing, testing, testing. Okay, we're back. Is, is it good now? Yes, it's great. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, maybe just uh, repeat the last sentence or two. Oh, by, by the way, you have about 10 minutes left. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so the last sentence or two were just that I wanted to give some intuition for how this is working since this was sort of technical. Uh, it's essentially a souped up Cardi formula. So Siegel Vey, you can think of this as a souped up Cardi formula. Um, it's souped up because it includes the information from the other SL2Z cusps. And the point of the Siegel Vey theorem is that this souped up Cardi formula gives exact results, uh, not for an individual theory though, it gives exact results for the average theory. Now we know the Cardi formula is related to the BTZ black hole. So uh, expect this to be related to a sum over bulk saddle points. Uh, it also might be helpful to compare to, to, to the supersymmetric case uh, where something a little bit like this happens. Now, our partition function, our partition function Z is non-supersymmetric. Uh, for a supersymmetric index, often the singularities at the cusps together with the modular properties can be used to reconstruct the whole function. This is the story of the, the fairy tale or the, the Rademacher sums. For our non-holomorphic partition function, siegel vey plays a similar, similar role, uh, but because it's non-holomorphic, it's, it's, it contains a bit less information. So siegel vey plays a similar, similar role, uh, but it, it can only reconstruct the average over some genus of similar partition functions. So that's, what, that's what's happened here. To state the final answer, when you put back in the, the eta functions and everything, the final answer um, for the average of the free boson is this formula here. So the chi zero is the Virasoro vac, or sorry, not, not Virasoro, it's the vacuum character for the chiral algebra in this theory, which is U1 to the N current algebra. Uh, and the average is given by taking this vacuum character and summing it over SL2Z images. As I said, the sum can essentially be done, and the resulting spectrum is continuous. It extends all the way down to the unitarity bound, um, and uh, has a. But but I should point out that that even though the spectrum goes all the way down to zero, it has a normalizable vacuum state because every theory in this ensemble has a normalizable vacuum state. So this is a, is a continuous spectrum, but it differs from something like Louisville 
uh, where where the vacuum would not be normalized. And that's a that's a interesting feature that you can get when you have an ensemble average that was also seen in, in the Maloney Witten calculation. In the uh, case with matter, the deformed WZW model, the average is a similar formula. Um, the only difference here is that appearing in the sum, appearing in the SL2Z sum, is uh, this thing here, which is called the string function of the WZW model. Uh, it's essentially a parafermion character up to some prefactors. So it's the character uh, of this extra stuff that's been added. Uh, but the zero here indicates that we're only including the uncharged parafermions. So that there's some, or the, the uncharged piece of the parafermions. Uh, maybe easier than the equation is to say this in words. To get the average of the WZW model, what you do is you start with the WZW model, you project onto the uncharged U1 primaries, and then you sum over SL2Z. This project and sum over images procedure uh, will correspond to the bulk sum over topologies, which is analogous to the sum over BTZ black holes. So now I can turn to the holographic dual. So the dual theory, as I said, is this, this uh, abelian turn simons theory at the perturbative level. It has N left moving and N right moving uh, U1 turn simons fields. And then we sum it over topologies. Not all topologies, but uh, just over the, uh, a set of topologies, which really was just designed to get a, a reasonable answer. Uh, but it's a natural set, it's the, it's the handle bodies. Uh, for the torus, this is the same as the sum over BTZ black holes. Although this theory is topological, um, calling, them, calling them black holes is, is uh, well, I just mean a sum over those topologies where you, you close the, you fill in the solid torus uh, in all the different ways corresponding to the SL2Z black holes. So this is U1 gravity. Uh, now, a caveat is that I've given you a prescription for how to do calculations. But this is only a semi-classical definition. Um, it includes the effect of additional topologies and the effect of all loops. This theory is one loop exact, uh, but isn't a complete non-perturbative definition. Whether this is similar to, to JT gravity, I don't know. This is, this is a, a, a different case where we have a semi-classical definition. When you add matter, um, this Theory in the bulk is coupled to topological matter to account for the the neutral part of the the parafermion contributions. One one quick question about that. Yeah, it somehow it, I would have guessed it would have been the non-abelian Chern-Simons theory. Is that wrong for some obvious reason? Well, I, I think there. So we don't. Um, so first of all, we don't have a we don't completely understand this topological matter. I think the topological matter is a, a non-abelian Chern-Simons theory. Um, but another comment is that um, the WZW model is just one point of enhanced symmetry on the moduli space. Most of the moduli space does not have SUN. It only has U1 to the N. So um, like in the free boson, uh, there's an enhanced point in moduli space with, with SU2, but, but we don't put SU2 gauge fields in the bulk, but we put U1 because that's, that's the, the current that exists everywhere in moduli space. So I think it's natural to get um, this, this, this abelian churn simons theory, but the extra topological matter uh, for the parafermions is some churn simons field that account for that, that coset. So there will be some non-abelian churn simons fields in this sector. Okay, thanks. Okay, and then the statement of, of the evidence for the duality at the level of the torus is that uh, these partition functions are, of course, equal. So if we take the, the bulk theory, include the loop contributions, it's one loop exact. So we can include all the perturbative contributions and some over the solid tori. And by design, uh, this is equal to the, the average as calculated with the Siegel value formula. This duality, uh, I'll just mention, has been extended to higher genus. It holds it all genus with a particular uh, choice of which topologies to sum over. This was shown by Maloney and Witten. 
So for example, uh, there's, a, there's a connected contribution uh, with two boundaries, uh, which is the double torus. The integral over moduli is done after, uh, is done last. Uh, so that correlates the, the, the two partition functions. So this doesn't, it's not supposed to factorize and it doesn't factorize and you can compare bulk to boundary and they agree. From this, you can extract, uh, for example, the energy level correlations in this ensemble. Uh, there's a, the, the leading term is, uh, is Poisson, Poissonian. Uh, the, these leading, at leading order, these, these energy levels are independent, but there are non-zero, there are correction, important corrections to this. So it's not, it's not actually Poisson. So I think uh, Poisson alone would not satisfy the modular bootstrap equations. Um, so, I think, well, intuitively, I, I, I don't know if this is right, but I think of it as being sort of as Poissonian as possible, consistent with, uh, consistent with modular invariance, and that requires you to add uh, additional corrections. Okay, with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, a couple comments um, before I do that. First of all, I do not think that realistic theories of gravity have averaging. Uh, nobody is claiming that, or at least I'm not claiming that. Uh, but um, nonetheless, we can use ensemble averaging as a tool. We use it to coarse grain over microscopic details and study universal uh, semi-microscopic aspects of gravity. I think we can compare this uh, to what we do in the renormalization group uh, or perhaps to how disorder is treated in kinetic matter theory where um, you know, we, we average over disorder because it gives us some universal things that we can calculate um, and um, not, not, because, not because we think a, a sample of, of material has an actual disorder averaged uh, description. Okay, finally, a couple questions. First of all, what is the mechanism for this uh, thing that we keep seeing where averaging becomes topology? Uh, this is, again, just an incarnation of the, the black hole information paradox. Somehow, when we, uh, when we see connectedness in, in gravitational path integrals, somehow what seems to be happening is that the sum over uh, UV microstates is, is uh, some, some, some piece of that sum or some average of that sum is gluing together the, the manifold to create some higher topology. Um, and um, the, the, the problem is to understand how that works. In particular, which aspects of the microscopic theory can be extracted from averaging? What observables are universal? Which ones can be calculated in the infrared? And uh, a couple more questions related to this duality are whether it can be embedded into string theory uh, and uh, whether there's some more role for this Siegel Day formula in string theory. There's a whole, there's, there's a whole host of other uh, versions of Siegel Day, including, including ones that, uh, that might be more applicable to, to something with supersymmetry. And I'll end there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Any questions from the audience here? Or... One moment. Um, thanks for the nice talk, Tom. So I have sort of two questions, and it's about the, the matter that's present in your example. So how much matter is there? Like, is it also like the currents? You know, you have n currents, so you have n fields at weight one. How many matter fields do you have, say, at weight one? Or, or, or how does it grow with, with scaling dimension? Um, let's see. Um... It depends on the level. So now, that, now there's a level, and um, we have so we have different parameters to play with here. Um, as you, if I remember correctly, as you increase the level, k, you get more matter fields. Um, so if you if you take if you take k equals one, I should have mentioned that if you set k equals one, then the WZW model just gives back the free boson. Um, so as you increase k, you get more light matter fields. So say for k equals two, you have. I'm just asking, is there a tower like, or how does it work? Where you have just a, you have a finite number of fields and that's it. Oh no, it's it's infinite. These these string functions have an infinite Q expansion. 
They have an infinite queue extension. Yeah. You're not level two. Okay. And and the second question is, what about the charged operators? What happened to them? Do they get like averaged out and they're so like the, the equivalent of the Cardi formula counts also operators not just by weight but by charge, and that's where they lie, or they have completely disappeared. Um, well, they come back when you the the charged operator. It's the charged operators come back when you sum over images. It's only in the in the um, it's only in the the first term in the SL two Z sum where there's nothing that's charged. So they come back in a way that's basically uniform in charge space after you do the SL2Z sum. Actually, I have one question. Um, I mean, there's the old duality, you know, Witten relating and others uh, relating Chen Simon's theory, you know, sorry, the WZW model to Chen Simon's theory on an interval, right? And you could deform that too, you know, it would be like some change of the boundary conditions of SU and Chen Simons on these two, um, you know, this interval times whatever space, you, you know, at the level of the Hilbert space. And is, is there any way to connect that to this duality? Like, could you, in other words, could you take that setup and then do the averaging there? You would think of it as some like averaging over the boundary conditions for this Chen Simons theory and I don't, That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Uh, one can speculate that maybe uh, that maybe the alpha states of this theory are are the old duality, and uh, perhaps it connects in that way. But I I don't know any way to do it to do that calculation. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, there's a question from the remote audience. Please just uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, Tom, thanks for the talk. I have a question. I missed the first two minutes. So my apologies if you mentioned this <laughs> uh, at the very, 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 very beginning. Um, but I was wondering if this uh, gives you a new way how to think about chiral gravity and extremal CFTs. Because in extremal CFTs, well, in, in just holomorphic, like you, I, I, I was just thinking about this because you mentioned the supersymmetric cases where the things are determined by the polar coefficients. But if, but if you just have like, it doesn't have to be the elliptic genus. So if you just have like a holomorphic, a chiral theory, uh, you can also determine its partition function by its most polar, well, polar terms. And, and if this gives us a new way how to think about the monster CFT and uh, uh, how we define chiral gravity, like my, could that be a better way how to implement perhaps these ideas and connect to something that is more gravitational in comparison to this you want to be n Chen Simons theories? Maybe, maybe the the um, actually the um, well I could say a couple things. One is that we don't really we don't know how to go back to Virasoro, right? So so I started at the beginning by saying that we're going to replace Virasoro by U1, and we don't know how to go back. That's true even in the even in the chiral case. I don't know how to 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 write down. Oh, you know. There's one copy of Ferris, sir. Um, well there you mean in you mean in, in this? Chiral gravity, there's one copy, there's boundary conditions that give you one copy of Ferris. No, no, I mean I, I mean using Siegel Ve. See, so I don't know how to take we have this Siegel Ve for for current algebra, and I don't know how Ah, to, that's what you mean. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 so the naive, the naive way to go back to Virasoro would be just to take the Virasoro characters and sum over images, but that's exactly what Maloney and Witten did, and it, and it, it didn't work. So uh, the problem of, of going back from, from current algebra to Virasoro seems to be a difficult one. Um, now, I like the idea of trying to do it in the chiral case. That does sound ma like maybe it would be a little easier, but I don't know of it. I don't know of any work on that. Okay. Yeah, the CFT side still sounds puzzling because, like, yeah, there was all this work on trying to find these extremal CFTs, but people were trying to just find like one theory, and so. But maybe if you think of it of like, oh, trying to find an average of theories that are chiral, and but yeah, it might be easier to find the average. That's kind of the lesson of of a lot of this, and 
Um, I should also mention that, that that's a perspective that's very common in, in, like, in math um, and the theory of lattices. And, and that's how we stumbled across this duality was we were looking for lattices with a large, with a large gap. And in the theory of lattices, you, you can't find those, but, but it's, it's a common strategy to average over them instead. And, and that's much easier. So maybe the same is true there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any one last question? Okay. We'll take this one here. Uh, sorry. This is more like a comment about the uh, previous Daniel's uh, uh, question. So, so if, if you want the, the marginal deformation for the John Simon theory, then one way to realize that is to uh, go to the Maxwell John Simon theory. So you, you add the Maxwell term. And uh, and then if you change the take the linear combination, you can go back to the chance simon theory. But then that misses this uh, translation condition. So uh, so indeed there was a paper by uh, Glukov, Martinez, Strominger, and sorry, there was one more person uh, doing that. And then if you start start with the Maxwell chance simon theory and then uh, put the appropriate boundary condition, then you get the uh, uh, yeah Ziegel Narayan set of function before aberration somehow. So, so what's interesting is that in that in that context, it's before averaging there was already a duality uh, to Maxwell Chan Simon theory, and and then after Chan Simon's average, somehow you get this type the Chan Simon theory which he was talking about without the Maxwell term. So that that's how the story goes. Up if you just naively translate. Yeah, yeah, I agree. In in that case, the Maxwell term was sort of being taken to. To zero or or infin infinity, it was kind of it was kind of playing the role of a regulator, but it was but it was entering in a central way, like you say, it was it was eventually determining the the Narain lattice on the boundary. Right. Okay. Well, I think we have reached the hour mark, so let's first uh, thank Tom again for a very nice talk.